Hi guys, thank you very much for joining me. My name is Adam Harris from Trade with Precision. I am, just bear with me for one second, please. I am trying to, um, I'm trying to stream from a different platform as well. So give me a second while I try to do that. <clears throat> Welcome, thank you very much for joining me. I'm uh, just trying to see what's going on with the stream key uh, quickly. This is part of the strategy and focus webinar series. And what we're gonna be talking about is which stocks could be trend setters in August but I wanna have a look at the bigger market uh, thing. So let me just check something here quickly. Okay, so on the agenda today, we're gonna to be talking about the momentum outlooks for indices such as the S&P 500 and the ASX 200, how to scan for trending stocks and determine the likelihood of continuations, how to use trend lines and moving averages to uncover support and resistance, and popular momentum indicators that help signal when a trend could reverse. This is the momentum indicator is incredibly powerful. RSI is also very good for this. And the effect of news and economic data. So, um, first of all, what I have done is I have uh, created a list of three things that we really want to be doing. First of all, we want to work out which way is the trend. Should I be buying or selling? This is absolutely crucial. Should I be a buyer or seller? Now, the short answer is in the global indices and in the stock markets, we tend to rather want to be a buyer rather than a seller. Buying is the safest way to go. Selling is highly risky, and most people lose money not from buying, but from selling. They'll tell you that they bought into poor stocks, but for the most part, it's actually from selling when they should be buying. So I want you to think about that for a while. I want you to have a look. If you've ever been involved in engaging in the indices, especially the indices as well as stocks, where have you had your greatest losses? If you've had, uh, has that been from your selling? Um, two questions. Has that been from selling? Uh, first of all, and secondly, has it been from buying something that's been trending down? Okay, so we want to look at which way the market is going. Is it trending up or trending down? And um, then we want to have a look at the direction. So then it becomes, first of all, direction. So do we, are we buying or selling? Then it's timing. And so everyone talks about how timing is a tricky one, and it, it, it's emotionally tricky because when the market is breaking all-time highs, that's when your emotions are telling you to get in. But, but from, a, from a risk perspective, as well as a trading perspective, uh, it is not. Okay, so one of the things I'm gonna try and do while we, what we wanna do is, it's about time, you're asking me about timing. And so timing is actually tends to be, there's two things. Most people feel they should be selling when they should be buying, and they buy, and then when they should be buying, they're buying at the wrong time. So timing then becomes an issue. We wanna talk about timing. I'm gonna keep it relatively simple. So direction and timing, and then we should look for entries. So where should we look for entries? Location-wise, where should we look for an entry? Uh, and then what should we look for? What gives us the signal the price is starting to turn around, and how should we manage our risk? Okay, these I will keep coming back to these, but let's go and have a quick look at the S&P 500 as well as the ASX. Okay, so we'll start off with the S&P 500. This is from a previous webinars where I've done this, but I'm gonna go ahead and create a new one, and we're gonna just create a bit of a look for it. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna use the uh, traditional uh, setup that I create for Vantage, which is very straightforward. It is price action candlesticks. It is the 10 simple moving average, simple moving average, just simple or exponential, doesn't matter. Either way is perfectly acceptable. Um, it is, so the first thing is we've got a 10 simple moving average or exponential. We've got a 20 and we have a 50. These are very powerful. The 10 and 20 is gonna help us find the location for entries. It's gonna give us a location. And the 10, 20, and 50 together is gonna to tell us whether we should be buying or selling as well as price action. And the 50 gives us a really good sense of where the markets are. Um, <clears throat> okay, so first of all, I'm gonna to go to, <clears throat> we have a daily and a weekly and a monthly. And it's really important to understand that the markets are going to go through, the markets will move through these different phases. So high lows, high highs is an uptrend. And it's really important, a single move is not a trend. Let me repeat that, a single move is not a trend. A single move down is not a trend. So when the market has a big day down, that does not mean it's a trend. That's really important. A series of moves are a trend. So an example would be in life, <clears throat> I don't know, if somebody lies to you once, that's not a trend. If they lie to you two times, that's not a trend. If they lie to you three times, that's a trend. That's now a trend. You've had enough uh, of a pattern of behavior <clears throat> to confirm the trend. That then tells you which way the market is going. Most importantly, in order to break the trend, we need to have 
three or four movements in the other direction to confirm that the trend has now changed. That's really important. Secondly, so this is the next thing, is we have time frames. Are we looking at a, at a shorter term or a longer term time frame? And every single time frame has a move and a pullback, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in. <clears throat> every single time frame has that. And we need to know where we are within the cycles for that time frame of that market. So let me illustrate this by way of a point. <clears throat> we have on the weekly, there's a move and a bit of a pullback, there's a move, bit of a pullback, there's a move, bit of a pullback, there's a move and there's a big move down. We actually broke this low. So what does it mean? It means that the uptrend on the weekly has been broken. <clears throat> but when you have, so let's do it another way around. If your weekly is doing this, your daily is doing this because they have their fractals and your four hourly is doing this. So you have patterns within patterns within patterns. So what does that mean? It means that when you see a market doing this and then doing this, the higher time frame is retracing. Does that make sense, guys? <clears throat> so now, so when it, that's when the trend is broken. So what does that mean? It means that right now this current uptrend is not happening. It means that this uptrend has pretty much come to an end. Now we need to go have a look at the higher time frame. So what's going on on the higher time frame over here, the bigger time frame? So we're going to go up to the monthly. And when we have a look at the monthly, I want you to see something. On every time frame, we tend to go away from the moving averages. We tend to go away and then come back. Go away, come back, go away, come back, go away, come back. And all we're doing now is coming back to the moving averages. And we haven't had this move since last year, August. I want you to pay attention to this part. August, uh, September, and October. Okay, so this is exactly what happened last year. August, September, October we are likely to see a correction. We could see a correction all the way down here, and that would still be acceptable. <clears throat> We've had an incredible bull run, and a pullback down to here, we'd be back up here by Christmas. So this is a beautiful opportunity for the markets to correct, have the market pull back, and then go back up to the new, uh, yeah. Okay, so it's very important. This is perspective. I want, you must understand that most of the media out there talks about the daily. They don't talk about the weekly or the monthly enough and the weekly and the monthly also have their corrections. In other words, are we in a monthly uptrend? You absolutely bet your bottom dollar we are in a beautiful, healthy, beautiful uptrend. Now, how long does it take to go from a bull market like this to a bear market like this? It takes three to 18 months. It can take anyway, sorry, from actually six to 18 months, not three to eight months, six to 18 months. And we've just had a bear market. We have a bear market about every five to 15 years. We have had one literally about 18 months ago. So the odds of us going back into a bear market are incredibly slim, not impossible, but just it might be the first time that's ever happened. And it doesn't make sense because US economy is doing the best it's done in 60 years. So that doesn't make sense. Yes, the US has some debts it has to solve that we have global debt and we have other debt. And it's not the US that has its issue only. Sorry, it's not only the US that has issues to resolve. It's every country. And they're working on that. And the current administration has actually reduced the debt, even though they've also added to it. So they've actually managed to work off the loan they've made. They're starting to work off that. So they're very, very savvy when it comes to doing this. Um, now, uh, we are in an uptrend. So what are we experiencing now? There is the highest, greatest probability that we are simply experiencing a cyclical correction into this area. So now the question is, to go back to the list, which way is the trend? The trend is up. Remember, a single move down is not a trend. The trend is the series of moves. So we are experiencing a pullback within an uptrend. So the trend is up. Guys, let me say that again, the trend is up. All right, the trend is up. So now we want to talk about direction and timing. So we want to talk about where to get in. This is very important, where to get in. So if we look at the S&P monthly, we are experiencing a bit of a correction. The weekly has broken its lows, but it's still very nice. If we look at the daily, we've got this bigger correction down. And it looks scary because it looks as though we're kind of back to where we were. Let's have a look. How far back have we gone? How much have we given back? I mean, currently, we're sitting at back at where we were in May. Um, and we're back in May, so call it May, um, on the S&P. If we go and have a look at the ASX, 
Did I put it near the top? <clears throat> it's this one here, isn't it? Let's go straight to the monthly. Don't even look at anything else. When you don't know what's going on, you want clarity, immediately just go to the monthly. What do we see when we look at the monthly? We see a lot of things. We've got an overall trend to the upside. This is COVID. This is a strong level of resistance that the market has managed to break through. So once it breaks through that level, it's good. In theory, that means, or from experience, that means it's got good room to go to the upside. We've got a higher low here. So price broke through retested it, went up, and it's currently having a correction. But we are still in an uptrend on the monthly. It's a bit choppier. It's not as smooth as the S&P 500. It's a bit choppier, but that is the trend. Okay. <clears throat> so that is the trend. It's going up. It looks good. It's got a nice little correction and it's sitting at pretty much at where it was last month, even if we go back all the way to January, February, March, April, May. It's all still in the same area. So we have bull markets on the SP 500 and the ASX. Now, why include the SP 500 in today's topic? Because not only is the US economy the biggest in the world by far, uh, not only is the US dollar the biggest, uh, most widely used currency in the world, <clears throat> more than 90% of the Earth's transactions or transactions on the planet are done in the US dollar. The dollar is not weakening despite a lot of misinformation and disinformation out there. The BRICS countries are not going to take over. They're going to expand our offerings. So that's also disinformation out there. Um, and yes, Bitcoin and cryptos are not about to take over the US dollar. All of that stuff is sheer nonsense because the people who propagate that stuff, make a lot of money fear-mongering and selling people that stuff. There's Fear-mongering has become one of the biggest billion dollar, multi-billion dollar industries in the world. So disinformation, big part of that. So we're in a bull market, we're having a nice correction, it's beautiful, it's cyclical. We had it in September last year. Every September we tend to have really bad months and we usually then are followed by a Santa Claus rally to go up to December. So we've kind of got a sense of where we are and the monthly becomes a really good indicator of that. And we will always have monthly corrections. We will always have them, it will happen a lot. The S&P 500 is made up of 500 companies. It's the biggest, next to the Russell 2000, it's the biggest sample size of global companies from Starbucks to Nike, you name it. If it's around the world and it's listed on the S&P 500, we can get a good sense of that local stuff. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> And uh, so that's why the S&P 500 is a great, like a windsock or a weather vane to get a sense of what the global economy is doing. If the S&P 500 is struggling, that tells you the whole world is struggling because we would, they would get that information from the McDonald's and the, you know, all the different companies around the world that you can imagine, Estee Lauder, Disney, they're global companies. Okay, so um, now, we are, so now we know that the direction for sure is going up. We're looking for an entry. So let's talk about where our potential entries are. If we look at it from a monthly perspective, we know that our entry is likely to be either between the 10 and 20 here, if it's a shallow retracement, and if it's maybe a bigger one, sometimes it comes back down to the 50. We know that it's going to be somewhere between the 50 uh, and doing this. And how do we know that? We know that probabilities are that's going to be the case. Why? Well, because the economies are looking good. There isn't any, uh, the world is not really in trouble. In fact, the world is looking, the economy is looking really, really good. Um, and we've had a fantastic bull market for the last 18 months. We've just had COVID and a bear market. Um, so we, we're, there's plenty of, there's no reasons for us to have another bear market right now. Uh, economies are doing really well. The numbers are looking very good. Even in the UK, they're looking better than they normally look. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, and so, and one of the things that's interesting, and I want to just talk about this here, when I look across social media, I see the following things. I see companies, corporations announcing record profits, like record profits everywhere. Next thing they announce is how much their CEOs are getting paid, absolutely ridiculous amounts of money. And the third thing they then announce is laying off 10,000 people, for example. So these three things always happen together. They lay off tens of thousands of people, announce record profits, and CEOs get paid a lot of money. What does that actually mean? It means that the companies are making money and they're laying off people because they don't need them and they're making so much money. They're not struggling. If we were seeing record losses, CEOs not taking any payment and they have to lay off job uh, people, that's when they're in trouble. We're not seeing that. Right now, what you're witnessing is 
corporate greed on an astronomical level. And during COVID, a lot of people managed to get household savings went up. People weren't traveling as much, weren't spending as much on fuel, transport, all kinds of things. And so household savings went up. And so corporate greed responded to that by trying to tap into everyone's household savings by upping prices. So when you go shopping, your shopping went up by 40% inflation, by 100% in some cases. And only now are they starting, now that people's savings are running out, are they starting to bring their prices back down. So basically they upped their prices because they knew that people could afford. It. It's just really that simple. Um, and so when you hear things like, you know, Warren Buffett is taking profits on Apple, for example, yes, he's taking profits because as far as he's concerned, the market is getting too hot and it's due for a correction and September's around the corner, makes sense to exit those positions now. So when the market is at a really good correction, he can then buy again. That's what you want to be doing. That's what a seasoned professional will be doing. So the next thing we're going to do, so we talk about the trend, we're going to talk about direction and timing. We want to talk about where we want to get in. So we do know that it's going to be somewhere around that 50 period moving average or the 10 and 20 period moving averages. Um, and so uh, let me just do one more thing here so I can just make sure that I am being uh, thorough with my uh, stuff. So just want to make sure that I am doing this properly. Okay, so let's just go through. We're doing very well here, by the way. No, there's no OBS here. If I try and reinstall it, will that happen? Will that work? Let's see if we've got the latest one. Just see if this does. So, <clears throat> and this is really important because when you're when you're new to this, you, you get driven by fear and emotion. So when you hear about people talking about trader mindsets and investor mindset, this is precisely what they're referring to. So if you're feeling fear right now and panic right now, um, that is exactly what you're not supposed to be feeling if you are a seasoned investor. Okay, we're gonna try one more thing here and see if this works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't like it. Go to meeting and IGCC tray. I don't want it to kill go to meeting because it won't let me do that. Okay. Um, so I'm going to also put on my camera here so you can see my face and I'm going to uh, just get rid of that. So basically this is really important that we understand this. Now what we're going to do is talk about entry. So we know that the entries are going to be roughly between the 10 and the 20 or the 50. That's a worst case scenario. Now if you do Fibonacci retracements for example, so let's go look at Fibonacci retracement. Fibonacci retracement from the most recent swing low to the most recent swing high puts us here at a 382 down to a 618. This is your sweet spot, ladies and gentlemen, and that is your sweet spot. It also puts us near the high of the previous highs over here. So I would call this, and I think this is probably a stretch. I think we're somewhere in this area. My expectation is that come September, which is historically the worst month, so September would be, this is September last year. This is, sorry, October last year. This is September when the market dropped. Let's have a look down here. This is September the previous year. So September the previous year is the very bottom of the market there and here the very bottom of the market kind of here. Okay, so please understand. There we go. Uh, this was September? No, that was March. Okay, was this September? Just curious. That was uh, October, but we had a correction there. Okay, what was this one? That was September. So there's September, October correction. Uh, here's September, October correction, September, October correction. Therefore, we could have a turning point around about by the October. So this is really important because we're talking today about which markets we should be looking at. But we also know, and this is the most important part that I'm going to get to now. <clears throat> what are we looking for? So let's go to the thing here. What are we looking for that would tell us that there's a turnaround? Okay, so how do I know that it's turning around, Adam? This is what we're looking for. We are looking for a green candle, guys. The green candles represent the buyers returning. Okay, it represents the buyers returning to the markets. We have one here. We have one here. But tells me the buyers are coming back to the market. We're also looking for very strong rejection candles. So look at the green candle here, green candle here, look at the green candle here. Ideally, we're looking for a very nice, what would be ideal, could even be a red candle with a strong tail. Okay, a red candle with a strong tail or a green candle. But this would be a beautiful rejection candle, ideally, or a green candle. So we're looking for a green 
bullish candle in this area. That means a month's worth of buying, a month's worth of buying, which means the buyers have returned and they are ready to take it off. Now, I believe that it's better for us to get the correction from here than from here. I think the markets need a deeper correction. I think they need uh, they need a deeper correction. I think so. I think it would be better to pull back to here. So that means that on on most of the stocks we're going to go have a look at. I'm going to be looking for those. Remember that some of these stocks are really expensive. Imagine Nvidia. So we'll have a look at Nvidia. The problem for most people was buying Nvidia was got too expensive, and you do not want to buy it. So I'm going to give you a massive, massive golden golden goose tip here. Goose that lays the golden egg. We the moving averages are like a train station. So price is leaving the train station, that comes back to the train station, it's leaving the train station. We do not want to buy when it's left the train station. We only want to be getting in from within the moving averages. So this is my location, ladies and gentlemen, that's my location. And if it carries on down to here, which is not impossible, but very unlikely, I would then probably add to my position there. We'll talk about risk in a moment. So you don't put your house on this. You don't put every penny you have into this. That's dangerous. You would put a budget into this. That allows you to get away with that. Okay. Why would the S&P likely recover? Why would the ASX likely recover? Because they're made up inherently. All of their constituents are healthy, strong companies. At least the majority of them. Are. You get a couple of fraudulent listings. Um, you get like Donald Trump's media company that clearly doesn't offer any services. There's no proprietary technology. There's nothing in it. It's just there to launder money. Um, so it doesn't really offer any value to anyone. It's got. It's not worth five billion. It's clearly fraudulent. Um, you get those. They do. You manage to get listed because they tick all the boxes. And if they won't get listed somewhere, they'll go to another country and do it on the Hong Kong exchange. That happens all the time. If you're in business, in acquisitions and mergers, you know how to do that. Um, but for the majority, these companies will make profit. And if they don't, they drop down to the bottom of the list and then eventually they just get delisted. So the company is basically made up of the winners. It's like the Olympic Games. And the ones that are in it are meant to be winners, which means that they represent the very best of the stock market in general, which means they'll be the first to recover and they'll be the healthiest of the bunch. So we can use that as a great indicator of what the state or health of the market is. That's what's most likely to recover. So if you're a very nervous investor, you're incredibly scared, like I don't know what to do, this causes me too much stress, then focus on the index. This is called index investing. It's the safest, easiest way to become a millionaire in your youth. Every time it comes back to the moving averages, you just put in every penny you have every month, but it doesn't matter whether it's going up or down. And it's statistically is the best investing vehicle that exists in the universe. Okay, it's a very straightforward process. You just buy into the index and you buy into the strongest index. You don't have to buy into the Australian index if you live in Australia. You can buy into the S&P, you can buy into the FTSE if you like that, it's up to you. But buy into it because it performs well. So focus on which one performs the best. This is really good. So we've worked out here that buying from the moving averages is statistically the best place to get in. And that if it isn't in the moving averages, you're chasing the markets, you've got to wait for them. That means that every year we get a really good opportunity around about September, October, excuse me, when the market has been performing well, to get into the markets at a really good price. If Nvidia goes like this, I don't want to be buying here, I want to be buying here at a discount, okay, at a discount. So you can't argue now that we haven't spoken about how to determine whether we should buy or sell. I've told you guys never sell in the markets, it's just not worth it. We've spoken about where we should look to get in, which is going to be in the moving averages. What we should look for is a nice green or bullish candle. That's usually a sign the buyers are coming back in. Let's go and test it. So let's go and look at a few stocks to see what's going on. I'm a massive proponent. I'm just a big fan of Ray Dalio, Warren Buffett, uh, Charlie Munger, um, uh, Peter Lynch, um, John C. Bogle. These are all the, just the best investors of uh, of you know, of the century. And they, there's no point in messing around. You're not looking at pink slip stocks. You're not looking, at ga it's gambling if you think it's a lottery ticket. I need to buy this stock because I heard this rumor that such and such and such, and it's gonna spike and I'm gonna make my fortune. That's not how the best investors make their money. They look for stuff that has the surest sign that's gonna keep making money. And then they just look for a good entry. So an example of that would be, let's look at Apple. Let's look at Apple. <clears throat> Get rid of the um, indicators over here. Let's look at Apple. What's the trend? The trend is up without a doubt. Here's your support resistance levels. Big ones. Those are all buying points, all in the moving averages. 
there they are. And here we are, we've got a beautiful pullback. So there's a buying entry point and there's a potential entry point as well. Okay, that's gonna be my area where I'm gonna be looking for those buying opportunities between now and October. Okay, <clears throat> um, beautiful. And I can get it at a discount. Is it likely to come back down to these levels? I mean, I'm just looking back at 2012. Not very likely. Not very likely. Uh, Tesla. So Tesla's not really in that, in that situation. Tesla is, has a problem. Why do I say, why did I say Tesla was fraudulent? <clears throat> it's overvalued. They're not, they're not the leader in the car markets anymore. Porsche makes a better battery. Uh, they've got the charging networks. They don't really have the proprietary information now and they're not fixing the problems. The Cybertruck was an abysmal failure. They've had to recall every single Cybertruck. They're on their ninth recall in 2024, not just in the Cybertruck, but in other cars. The Model 3 is outstanding. The brand new Model 3 is outstanding. There's a new Model Y that's coming out. It looks amazing, but they don't have the edge anymore. They don't corner the market anymore. There are cheaper um, cars coming out that are individually all targeting all the edges that they used to have. And none of them have erratic CEOs who are smearing hatred and trying to undermine democracy on the, on, you know, just keep it very, very simple. Um, and also they're doing funny things with the books. They're pretending they've sold Cybertrucks and they haven't. They've only sold 11,000 Cybertrucks. They keep saying there's a million that are being sold. They haven't, they've only sold 11,000, but they're moving them off their books so that you create a offshore company that then buys them so they can move them off the books. Like there's all kinds of funny stuff going on. So very, very, very cautious with Tesla. Um, and you can see it in the price. The shareholders are not certain about it. It's, it's, it's in a weird place. And if it breaks down here, it's likely to continue down to these areas. So very, very cautious with that. But we look at something like NVIDIA. So let's go to NVIDIA. The data doesn't really show very well on my side. So let's have a look at it from a weekly perspective, daily. <clears throat> I don't really have the data looking very good over here, I'm afraid. Um, so I'm not going to use that then, but I'd be looking for a nice correction down to the moving averages. Let's have a look at Amazon. Again, I want this data to come down. <clears throat> Let me just go and see something here as well. Let's go to the symbols. Uh, and let's have a look at a few of these. So if I'm looking at individual equities, for example, this one, I want to make sure as well. There is NVIDIA. Let's take NVIDIA off and then bring it back. Sometimes you have to do that. <clears throat> Where's my tools, history center? So this is what you sometimes have to do if your data doesn't look good. You might want to bring it, let's try NVIDIA, we'll do NVIDIA again. So we'll do NVIDIA here and what I wanna do is I'm gonna, uh, I want to download it. It's fine. Okay, there's no raw data for this. Just wanna see what I can get. Sometimes you can get the data. This is really what I'm looking for. Okay, see if it's any different. No, okay, so not getting any real data here. <clears throat> um, and a few of these, but really what I'm looking for with these, for example, what's important with Amazon was a really nice break of resistance, couldn't get past that, really nice correction, beautifully undervalued this. In fact, Amazon had one of the biggest corrections <clears throat> that I've seen. This was just such a sweet buying opportunity there, and it took off, and now it's having a nice correction back into this area. Okay, so this, again, what am I gonna be looking for in the coming months? Probably October, I'm gonna be looking for nice green candles over there to see what happens with this. We might get it sooner, but I'm gonna wait. I know this requires patience, ladies and gentlemen, but I'm gonna wait <clears throat> for a full month of a green, uh, a green candle, or a strong bullish candle. Okay, so let me draw that again. Let me show you the kind of thing I'm looking for. This is fantastic if you can get it. This is a great type of setup. Very clear if I got that there. Uh, any kind of a candle actually would be good. A green candle, it might even be something like this. Uh, this is also good. These are all great. Anything like that would be looking good. If I saw something like this, I'd also be happy. That really nice strong wick is a good sense of buyers pushing back and it could be red. So something like that is what I am looking for. So if we go back and have a look at this, we've got which way is the trend that's up, but up, but currently 
retracing. That's the part we need to understand. Pulling back, okay? Direction and timing. Where should we look for entries? So we know the direction. Now we're looking for timing. Where should we look for entries? In the moving averages, what should we look for? A nice bullish candle, nice green, nice bullish. How should we manage our risk? So this is how we do it. It depends on who you are as, a, as an investor or slash trader. Are you looking to take 20 positions? Are you looking for a bit of Amazon, a bit of Tesla, a bit of Disney, a bit of uh, HK? What are you looking for? These different things, NVIDIA, so on and so forth. The more you're looking for, the more you need to divide up your profit, so your, your budget. So let's just say, just say you've got a 10K account, 10K account. First of all, first of all, you can't use all of that because you've got a thing called margin. So when you go to buy a house, you have to put a deposit down. Usually if you're not buying a cash, that's your mortgage. That is your margin. So you have to put that down, buy the house. When you sell the house, it, the banks will release the difference between what you sold the house for and what your deposit is. And if you made money on the house, you get that on top of your original deposit. But you can't go, you know, especially when you're trading on margin or doing all these things. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that's the, you're going to be limited by margin. So probably, you probably look at, depending on what your, uh, your um, leverage is. So what is leverage? Okay, so your margin is your deposit on a property. Your leverage is how much margin is needed to open up a position. So when you go to buy a house now, they usually want 20 to 25% deposit. So that's a, that's a four to one, give or take, approximately a four to one leverage on property. On stocks, it's often a 20 to one leverage, meaning you've got to put down about one twentieth of the position to be able to open up that trade. So you, you're, that's, it depends on what your leverage is. It could be 20 to one, um, or 1 to 20, 1 to 50, 1 to 100, so on and so forth. So the higher your leverage, the more positions you can open, but the more exposure you're going to have. If the, if the market goes against you, you're going to get a margin call eventually, but by that time you've, you, you've lost 90% of your capital. When your margin number is lower, when your leverage is lower, like 1 to 30, you could get a margin call when you've got a 5% drawdown. So that, there's good things and bad things, but experience is really what helps us use them properly. So leverage is really is, is how much we can open that. But let's just say, for example, we're going to allocate 1% budget, budget per position. Okay, maybe 2%. Man, I'm sorry about the typos. Wow, just can't get this. Maybe 2%. Okay, maybe 2%. That's it. And we're limited after that. <clears throat> probably max 20 positions. Probably that. So it's probably going to be somewhere around there. Peter Lynch believed that it was better for you to have lots of small uh, pieces of lots of different stocks because uh, it allowed you access to a lot of different pies and your odds of success actually go up. Warren Buffett believes that if you know what you're looking for, but those are his proprietary exclusive, that's his experience talking, you only need to invest in one thing or five things. <clears throat> that's it. Believe it or not, for retail investors and traders, Peter Lynch's approach is actually better, meaning putting all your holdings into Tesla is incredibly dangerous. Putting, splitting it up into technology, different sectors, pharmaceuticals, uh, green technologies, um, different types of stocks, different EV companies that you like the look of, splitting it across 20 different things is statistically actually safer and more likely to have success. It also reduces your emotional investment in one company. You become more objective. You become better at going, this company is a problem. Like, I love Disney. I love the brand. I love Estee Lauder as a brand. But Estee Lauder is shockingly bad. They were performing so well. It's terrible now. It's a dumpster fire. Disney's stock is not performing well. Whether you like the brand and how it performs are two different things. And the more invested you are in different, different stocks, the more objective you become as an investor. Because you start realizing, holy cow, all my other stocks are going up. Why is this one not going up? I mean, I love it. But why is it not going up? So you become more objective. You become better at critical thinking because you can't avoid the reality, you know, if that's the case. So we start to look at this, which means we can look at all kinds of different things. And to keep it really straightforward, we would look 
for a green. So let's just say we get a nice little green candle here, nice little bullish candle here. Usually I'm going to be looking for my entry above the high of that. So I want price to break above the high of that to take me in. Okay. To take me in. <clears throat> That's one way to do it. Another way, this is a very advanced way to do it. A very advanced way is if I see this as a very strong support resistance level and there's the 50 period coming up and maybe there's a Fibonacci level there as well, I might decide to just simply put buy order there so that as price comes down, I get in and I go up. And that's usually done as a limit order. That's done as a limit order. If you're going to look at your uh, orders here, this would be a limit order. Pending order, you would do a buy limit because you'd be buying at a limit, which is how you do it. Otherwise, if it's above here, it's a buy stop. First of all, your direction. So buy, am I buying? Yes. Then it's a buy stop or buy limit. It's only one of those two. If I'm selling, it's a sell limit or a sell stop. But if I'm buying, it's a buy limit at the bottom and a buy stop at the, at the top. It's buy stop at the top, <clears throat> um, which doesn't work for a sell stop because that's a sell stop at the bottom. Anyway, so we, this is what I'm looking for. So that's managing my risk. Um, and then I would allow myself, like I said, I would allow myself up to that 2% drawdown and then I'd have to get out of it. But position sizing is when you calculate. If my entry is here and if it goes down to here, I want out. That means my 2% is this entire amount, which means I look at the price and I take my 2% budget and it is divided over the number of points here. So if that is 167 and that's, I don't know, 77, then that's going to be 60, 30, 90 points, give or take, 90 points. And that's going to have to be divided over 90 points. My 2% budget is divided over 90 points and it gives me a per point budget. <clears throat> I wouldn't be doing that myself personally. My stop loss would be here probably. Um, yeah. Okay. And I would be going about doing it. So that's managing a risk. So first of all, we would look for those. We would then determine how much we would do. And most importantly, we would use position sizing. Now, if you're not familiar with position sizing, guys, ladies and gentlemen, please, please master this. Position sizing is the key. Okay, it's called that. Look it up on YouTube. <clears throat> it's how we basically take our budget, which is 1% or 2%, which in this case would be 1,000. Uh, sorry, that's 10%, which would be 100 or 200. 100 or 200 bucks and I divide it over my entry to my stop loss. It is divided over the points difference because that's going to vary. With one stock, it's maybe going to be 10 points. With another, it might be 50 points. It's going to vary, but the budget is the same. The, the points will vary, but the budget will be the same. And so what happens is if I end up with 20 positions at 2%, that's 40% of my account being used or 20% of my account being used. And if those markets then go on to do 2 to 1 or 3 to 1, my 40% or 20% will go up to 60% or 80% growth on the account. So that's how it works. This is really important. If you're not familiar with this, that's a topic for a different day. This webinar is assuming you know this kind of stuff, um, but you need to look it up. That's absolutely crucial. There's so many typos on this. I can't get through a sentence <clears throat> without doing it. So let's have a look at a few more charts. Basically, let's run through a few more charts. Let's have a look at Meta. So one, first of all, Meta had one of the most incredible runs from the bear market, <clears throat> unstoppable. And I was one of the people that was quite critical of Meta. I was probably critical all the way up to here. I was like, ah, nobody uses Facebook anymore. And oh, it's just garbage, blah, blah, blah. What I didn't know was all the other stuff that had started to be, that people were using, Facebook Marketplace and all these different things. People aren't using Facebook for the things that it was originally, that it was originally well known for. Um, and this caught my eye. This is what's called institutional buying. Why do we say that? It's very, very methodical. You don't get this with retail buying. You can't. It's impossible that retail traders are that organized, systematic and methodical. But institutionals are, and that's just institutional buying. It's just too, it's too regimented to be a coincidence. The universe is too random to produce such a clean, clear sequence of a stock that is not a good buy. So clearly there was institutional buying, and around about here I figured it out, and then I started to get in on it. 
but I was heavily, <clears throat> in other words, I was wrong about the potential for Facebook at this point, but thankfully updated my opinion. And I would do that for anyone. I know I just criticized Tesla, for example, but if, if Tesla started to produce that, I would start buying it. Then there's something else I'm not aware of. Okay, so my point is, although I do, I don't have an opinion on every stock, I struggle a bit with Elon's personality. <clears throat> I think he's very dangerous, but that is my opinion. And that isn't necessarily everyone else's opinion. Um, but from a stock perspective, it's not a great stock. And by the way, I ordered the Model 3. I was one of the first people to put my money down on a Model 3. But I subsequently saw what was going on on Twitter and just said, I'm not, I'm not involved in the brand. Whereas, uh, whereas today, I, I love the Polestar. Polestar is incredible. There's a whole lot of other choices. This isn't meant to be hitting on Elon. This is really just about the fact that sometimes we like the brand, sometimes we don't like the brand, but also we've got to look at the chart. The chart gives us a really good clue as to the health of something. So for example, this has just been an incredible performer. Okay, that's Facebook. That's looking really good. Let's look at uh, Home Depot, just as an example. Home Depot still trending up, having a bit of issues here, but trending up. <clears throat> so this is interesting. I'm just going to add this one little bit in here. Politics wasn't really a problem until about 2016. In other words, most people in America, for example, with the companies were mostly on the same side. They had different ideas about policies, but what you didn't have was autocracy versus democracy. In other words, you didn't have uh, oligarchs versus um, freedom. What is an oligarch? An oligarch is when a person becomes so wealthy or a group of people become so wealthy, they start to actively interfere in the political system and the levers of justice in order to keep their wealth. And they start to mess with the freedoms of everyone who isn't wealthy. That's an oligarchy. And um, there's an oligarchy right now. When there isn't an oligarchy, then everyone is just kind of on the same page. Everyone is doing the same stuff. So the reason I bring this up is right now, there's a political divide in America between autocracy, in other words, pro-dictatorship versus pro-democracy. Um, and so companies have started to align themselves with it. Home Depot is one of the ones that's very invested in Project 25, which is Donald Trump's new manifesto for what they want to do to America, um, you know, post the election. Uh, or going forwards, just going forwards, not even post-election. They're already trying to implement a lot of those people. And the problem is that those are values are different from that have ever existed in any version of America up until now. And so companies are now in, people are having to pick a stock based on that company's brand values and ethics and morals because they're kind of leaning the Nazi way. And that's not exaggeration. That's very true. So, you know, if you feel like it's being political, it is because they've made it political. Now you can't, just trust that the company you buy the stock for is a good company. You now really have to be cautious of what their kind of what their awareness is. Anyway, so it's just a very interesting time that we live in. Let's have a look at a few more. So there's just a couple here uh, that I want to have a look at. We've got like two more minutes. I want to go through and point out a couple, but it's very exciting times. Let's have a look at building, uh, building Boeing. Let's have a look at Cat. Uh, let's go through and have a look. Robin Hood is an example. IBM Intel has been in the news. We've got JD. j and is a great one. Coca-Cola is a great one. These are phenomenal ones. Let's have a look at MACD, MasterCard, Visa you want to have a look at as well. <clears throat> These are really strong ones. Let's have a look at Unilever. So let's go through and uh, let's look at say, Toyota as a car brand as well. PayPal's terrible. Um, we've got a couple that, are, you know, that aren't looking that good. So let's go through and throw these on the chart. So we've got uh, Boeing. So let the data just come in. So Boeing is tanking, but this makes sense because, you know, paying out massive bonuses to corporates, but also um, also skimping on repair costs and definitely uh, not managing the health and safety the way that they should. So we can see the consequences of this now. And so this share price is tanking. We have a look at CAT. Okay, so CAT is doing well so far. Not a lot of data on this. It's pulling back. It's a good potential area if you get a nice green candle here. Let's have a look at Robinhood. <clears throat> Again, Robinhood having a little bit of a spike, but otherwise not really of great value. When you see a big drop like that, it is recovering, and there could be a potential buy opportunity. It could be at the beginning of a new move to the upside. I prefer more history. I want to see how the history is. <clears throat> here you can see, for example, IBM is doing okay. It's been in a downtrend for, for years but is now starting to turn up. So that's good. Intel. Intel is a massive red flag. This is not a good buying opportunity. You can see that it has been going down 
for quite a while. It's been going down from 2019 <clears throat> and it's fallen off a cliff. So Intel is a hard stay away. So if you have 20, if your budget is, I can pick 20 stocks, Intel should not qualify. There are hundreds of stocks you to pick from. You would not pick this because it's at a discount. It's falling off a cliff. It's not a good investment. You want something that's going to start making money within three to six months. So in other words, pick something that is already going up, but that you can get in on the moving averages. JD, near the bottom, I'd pass on JD. J&J looks good. Look at J&J. This is good. You wouldn't recognize it, but I'll tell you why it looks good. This is what's known as a bull flag. Once it breaks up through that, it's going to go. So J&J worth watching. McDonald's, Mickey D's, Mackey D's. Also looking very good here. Nice level of support. Nice bullish candles. We could see a move up. This one is going to be good. Beautiful. There's your green candle. We haven't quite taken off yet. We might get another one. We haven't broken the high yet. But it's but look at the history of it. Look at its track record. Visa. Same thing. Beautiful track record. So we want to get in on this because it spends most of its time going up. Unilever. Looking okay. Level of resistance there, but looking good. Like if we can get through that level. We should keep going. Let's have a look. Toyota, big correction. Okay, so that's a bit of a concern for me. The general trend is up, but it's a big correction. But again, if we produce a nice bullish candle in this area, I'd be willing to consider it. And PayPal. Okay, PayPal is a bit of a mess. I would actually stay away from PayPal. There's not enough data. You don't know this. But PayPal is right near the bottom. It's not performing well. I'd stay away from it. But I've shown you enough here that you see some really, really, really good stuff. Um, so just going to recap very quickly before we wrap up here. Uh, remember, which way is the trend? Trend is up. Once we determine the direction, we're looking for an entry. That's timing. Where should we look for it? In the moving averages. What should we look for? Nice bullish candle. How should we manage our risk? We've spoken about that. We would have 1% or 2% of our budget per position and look for a maximum of up to 20 positions. And we would look at position sizing as the how we calculate how to spread that 1% budget over our entry to stop loss and take it from there. We're looking at the monthly right now. We expect this to turn around between now and October. We expect it to turn around. It could turn around sooner, but September historically is the month. That's the month that turns around. We'll see. Um, and that is it, ladies and gentlemen. Listen, I hope that you found this instructive and useful. There's some insane gold nuggets in this. Um, I've been doing this for 15 years now, and I absolutely love it. And I love these big corrections because everybody else panics. And these are like sales. This is It's the only market where people seem to buy when everything becomes more expensive and panic and not buy when it becomes cheaper. Um, and that's the thing. Okay, so I'm going to leave you with that. But thank you very much. And uh, I wish you all the best. Here are the contact details. If you need any assistance with your accounts or with MT4, with the platform, please do not hesitate to get in touch with the lovely folks at Vantage Markets. Um, and here are the contact details for your specific region or anywhere. They are lovely folks. I've been chatting to them on the side because they're hoping to stream today. For all of those of you on who are streaming and couldn't see the stream, I really deeply apologize. I normally am able to stream with no issues today. It just didn't want to connect, and I'm not sure what the difference is. I'm going to have a look into it now, and uh, next time I'll do a test stream long before the webinar so I can make sure it works. And that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you the best. Thank you very much, and have a great week.